Hi, everyone. Can you guys hear me okay? Thanks for coming to our session on the last day of MCN. We're really excited um, to talk about mining 50 years of Muse Tech, which is um, a, one of the MCN 50 um, projects where we've been looking at job descriptions over the last 50 years to learn more about our field. So um, I'm Desi Gonzalez. I am the manager of digital engagement at the Warhol. Um, I'm joined here with uh, or by Sarah uh, Othwaite. Did I pronounce that right? Yeah. Outhwaite, uh, who is pursuing a master's in com human computer interaction and design at the University of Washington. She was previously at the Guggenheim, um, where she was the digital media manager. Um, I also have Sean Blinn with us. Um, he's a trustee and former board president of the Jacobus Vanderbeer House in Med Bedm Bedminster, New Jersey, and he's also an independent consultant. Um, and then um, on my left, I have Nancy Proctor, who has many titles, including um, <laughs> running museums on the web um, and the Muse Web Foundation, and she's currently the director at the Peel Center in Baltimore, which um, she'll later tell us a little bit more about that. Um, so the three of us, uh, me, Sean, and Sarah, have, are part of the job description history team, and we invited Nancy here to, um, we're going to be presenting our findings, what, what kind of what we've been doing, what we found, and then we invited Nancy because of her, just the perspective that she can bring on this subject, um, having been in the field um, and also many different roles. Um, so we're really excited to hear a response from Nancy as well. Um, so diving in. Um, so as you know, this is the 50th anniversary of um, MCN. So that's five decades of connecting colleagues in museum automation. And that's a line from, um, from one of the Spectra issues, the journal that MCN produced. Um, for for um, several years, uh, I really like that that line connecting um, colleagues in museum, or, or I like the colleagues in museum automation. Um, and uh, so over the course of 2017, we've been researching the past 50 years of job descriptions to gain insights into how um, the field of museum technology has developed. Um, we've had a number of goals in this project, including, of course, just celebrating um, the 50. 50th year anniversary, we've been mining these job descriptions in various industry literatures to see what kind of patterns and changes we see over time. And we were also um, kind of tasked with determining a fun way to represent research data to tell the story of change and continuity in the past half century, and then share these findings with our community. So I want to give a shout out to our amazing, amazing team, some of which are here with me, some of which are in the audience. It's included Sean Blinn, Sejun Kai, um, Sheila Carey, me, uh, Eric Johnson, Matt Morgan, Sarah Othway, and Nicole Reisenberger. So um, the research questions that really fueled us in this process include what makes a technology role and, and does what is considered museum technology change over time? Uh, when do these museum technology jobs shift from IT or in back end to more visitor facing? And then we wondered, is actually is that is that true or is this a, a, a an assumption, right? Um, how might museum jobs reflect or break away from technology buzzwords and trends um, in the larger zeitgeist? And finally, we were also interested in, in what kind of technical knowledge and skills have cultural institutions required of their employees and how have these shifted over time? So um, we produced a number of things, um, including a series of blog posts on the MCN blog. Um, that, uh, that, and this blog post go, really goes into different angles, uh, looking at angle, uh, um, at the data rather. Um, sometimes it's a broad overview. Sometimes we're digging into um, one specific role and seeing how that's changed because of technology. That was a really amazing blog post by Sheila on, um, on how the re a registrar's role has changed over time, for example, and starting to think forward as well. Um, we produced a number of data visualizations, which we'll be showing to you today. We're presenting at MCN. You may have catched the um, Sarah and Sean's great um, Ignite talk on uh, Tuesday that really went really rapid fire through five decades of, of trends changing over time and what that means for our jobs as well. Um, and then we've done, we produce bots and other interactive tools. So I'm going to pass it over to Sean. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, Thank you, uh, Desi, and thank you to everybody who's been involved with this um, project. It involved a lot of intense uh, scouring of data by a lot of people, and this is, again, as Desi said, uh, very much a, uh, a group project. 
why are we looking at job titles? Because job titles can uh, both illustrate and hide uh, job functionality. So to start off with, uh, what have we unearthed in the data mines? Uh, the original version 1.0 analog data packet. Uh, there, it turns out there's no one searchable database of historic job titles, which is a surprise to nobody. Much of the data is analog. Uh, some was later digitized through a lot of transcribing, cutting and pasting. Uh, the data collection, suffice to say, was just as important an aspect of this project as the actual data analysis. Uh, we considered, uh, you know, uh, 10, 15, maybe 20 job uh, sources of data at the start of this. Uh, some of them didn't pan out. Some of the ones that did, uh, Desi mentioned MCN Spectra. That was a journal that MCN published from the mid-70s through 2002. Uh, and we have to give a big shout out to our teammate, Nicole Reisenberger, for going to the MCN archives at the Smithsonian, physically digging through the data and taking photographs of every job ad and uploading them so we could actually read through them. Uh, Desi and Sarah have looked at annual reports from the Met, from the AMNH, and the Seattle Art Museum. Uh, this gives us a sample across 50 years from the same institution, uh, making, uh, Eric Johnson dug into, who's another one of our teammates, dug into historic job ads from the New York Times, uh, including some, finding some really early ones, one of which I'll show you in a, in a moment or two. Uh, starting around 1999, we could get data from the MCNL email list. This was, uh, thankfully, this was digital. This was searchable. We could put this into a spreadsheet. We could analyze it. This was awesome. A lot of data there. For 2016, we could get everybody's job titles who registered for MCN, uh, which gives us about 10 times more job titles than any previous year. Uh, so what didn't we find? And it's. Uh, what we can't find or what we didn't find is just as important as what we could. Uh, we could find the New York Times. What we could not find and could not search and simply didn't have time to search, really, were uh, small local and regional newspapers, many of which ha you know, may have ceased publication, most of which may not have digitized their archives. So what that means is that what, we, what we've been, been unable to look at are small regional museums. Uh, small number of employees who only advertised locally. That data just was not something uh, we had the ability to get to in the time that we had. There's a dissertation in this data. Uh, it's, it, sh it would be a great dissertation by somebody who's not me. So if anybody's looking for a dissertation topic, here we go. Um, so what this means, though, is that we may have missed interesting trends that were happening in smaller museums. Uh, Larger ones are the only ones who have, have the resources, really, to digitize their archives. Smaller ones, you know, you're putting on the great new program or you're digitizing your internal stuff. Which one's going to get chosen? Uh, this is just standard for any kind of historic research. It's nothing to be horribly alarmed about, but this is just how history is done. We find the most likely, find the data we can and come up with the most likely explanation for it. So by looking... Uh, we see here some of the annual reports we were able to look at. Um, why look at annual reports? It's because this gives us uh, a 50-year period to look at within the same institution. So by looking at the Met from 1967 through 2017, this gives us a chance to hold institution constant and look how a single institution changed. It makes it a little easier to do an apples to apples comparison. Um, museums, as it turns out, don't necessarily keep as precise records as of personnel as we do of our own objects and our collections. So by looking at these annual reports, these reports all had uh, reports about you know, what people were doing. It had some, some of them had, have staff listings. Uh, but it gives us, again, another data source uh, single institution over a 50-year period. What's important to note is that all of these had gaps uh, within their data. There are some years that, uh, that weren't digitized that you know, may not have been published. Again, this is uh, it's a standard thing that um, we don't have data. There are gaps in it. Not everybody has, uh, has every year. So to dig into the analysis, each one of us um, 
dug into the data using slightly different ways. Uh, Sarah, ha you'll see some of Sarah's amazing visualizations when I'm done. Um, they allow us to see some long-term trends. Uh, Desi dug into uh, museum leadership roles and how technology can rise to museum leadership. We'll hear from Desi, of course. And a big shout out to the Twitter bot that Desi developed, which you can and should follow at uh, MCN50jobs. It's awesome. Uh, what I did was to read through some of the job ads, uh, a lot of the job ads, and find ones that illustrated uh, larger points. These are snapshots. It's not necessarily the first time that anything appeared, but they illustrate trends. So this is one of the earliest job ads that we could find. This is for a financial analyst position at the Met from January 4, 1970, and one line to pay attention to is awareness of computer application helpful. <laughs> helpful. Uh, it was also an interesting struggle to try to understand what this was. Okay, awareness of computer application helpful. They're using the singular. Is there just one financial application? Is this referring to application of computers to solving problems in general? It could reflect something that was simply a commonly used term in linguistics at the time, just how people spoke. It was assumptions that may have been prevalent in 1970 that we don't know about. It could mean something else. We just don't know. But application of computer, uh, or awareness of computer application, helpful. Uh, there are no specific tech skills needed. Uh, presumably, the hire would, uh, would learn these skills on the job. Uh, this position has nothing to do with a visitor experience. Uh, we may not think that financial applications today may not directly affect it, but there's nothing here about the museum, the collection, its role in society, its impact, anything like that. Also significant by its uh, absence is a lack of any kind of statement about equal employment or um, affirmative action. Jumping ahead 19 years, we have a museum registration clerk at the Cooper Hewitt, lists some software skills, uh, but says that they are an advantage rather than a requirement. The focus is more on registration experience than technical skills. Uh, jumping ahead just a couple of years, uh, interesting changes in this documentation coordinator ad from 1993 from the Detroit Institute of Art. It does require computer literacy. Uh, registration experience is listed as desirable. The, this and the one before were both in the registration department. They uh, required three years of experience, uh, substitute education for experience, implying pretty similar positions in terms of ex level of experience in the job. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, we're starting to see a shift uh, towards computer knowledge. Uh, here's a IT manager at the Henry Ford. This is specifically a support position showing we real, that computers are becoming prevalent enough in museums that a support position really is needed. Very heavy on technical requirements. No mention of uh, museum skills. Uh, it does go beyond an equal opportunity statement and uh, to quote the ad, encourage women and minorities to apply. It does specifically call out a requirement to um, to include your salary information. It's not the first time in human history that uh, a job candidate had to include salary information, but uh, now we're seeing that uh, early on. This is a job ad just from last year. Uh, it's with Gallagher and Associates. This focus specifically is on the, um, on the visitor experience. Uh, the trend has shifted from not even mentioning visitor experience to an absolute focus on it. Uh, there's discussion of collaboration. It is, uh, we live in a col more collaborative work environment than people worked in in 1970. Uh, it involves a multi-sensory approach uh, to uh, create stories that t teach and impact lives. Uh, creating exhibits that include sights, sounds, and words. It's recognizing a lot of learning theory that's been developed uh, about how p visitors come with different motives. Everybody has different intelligences. 
Uh, most significantly about this, of course, is that it's not actually in a museum. This is with an external design agency, and this is one of the trends that we're interested in following from the past and looking to in the future is we see this in the corporate world, a long-term trend towards outsourcing. Is that going to be an ongoing thing in the museum field uh, or not? We shall see. Thank you. Hello. Wonderful. Aren't those amazing, those ads? So I, I took the next step in our project, um, and I was working on uh, visualizing our job history, trying to create a, if not 100% historically, scientifically accurate, then as accurate as I could manage impression of our history um, and of the evolution of museum technology through time. So this is um, a visualization of tech terms, not job titles, from the American Museum of Natural History annual reports. Um, it covers a 50-year period. Actually, there's digitized reports from prior to 1967 from this institution, which is pretty incredible. And it goes up to 2015, not 2017. Um, and I'm going to take you into the first half of this in a bit more detail and then the second half. And I'll also mention that um, in terms of dealing with the gaps in these visualizations and the way I put it together, if you're a data geek like me and you want to know about this in more precision, come talk to me later, ask questions, be glad to go into that with you in depth. So 1967 to 1987, um, taking a look at some of the terms that were used in the AMNH annual reports to call out what was happening at the museum. And this was directed toward uh, sponsorship and grants. So these were things that were not necessarily prevalent in job terms at the time, but it was the cool new initiative. Yes, Xerox was a really big deal in that early period. Um, and you probably can't see this, but that dark blue triangle is mini computer, and then we have a little tiny bit of Apple showing up all the way in the right-hand corner in that sort of green color. Um, so it was hashtag trending during this time, meaning what appeared and then disappeared uh, from the uh, annual reports. Xerox, automated, um, the word electronic, mini and micro computer, um, which reminds me of Android chargers, uh, and Apple um, was just showing up in this period. Hashtag classic, um, computer was referenced really consistently through all of these reports and uh, the word technology. Now, something that um, Nancy asked about the other day, was computer in this case referring to physical technologies or people? Because people, of course, were computers, and in this case, Actually, it's pretty consistently technologies, um, which is not necessarily usual for these institutions. This is a large science museum, um, and their tech was often involved in the creation of their exhibitions. Um, trailblazing, that yellow you see in there, that's actually digital. Um, and that's going to move us to the future. But I think it's really interesting that digital was showing up as early as the 1968 uh, annual report. And more recent history. Some things that have trended um, over the last 30 or so years come and gone. CD-ROM, supercomputer. Um, and interestingly, the very uh, word website and use of www, calling out website titles, that's really fallen off recently um, in the AMNH annual reports. Um, the new classic, uh, Interactive, came in in a very big way and has been with us pretty much since 1987. Um, uh, the term online, of course, is enormous. And then digital, even though it's been around since the beginning, um, has significantly more uh, presence um, in the last 10 years. And then we see some, um, what I'm calling these trailblazing terms coming in. Um, virtual uh, has appeared, uh, but the big, the big new uh, terms that showed up in these reports were iPhone, iPod, iPad, app and of course social media. Uh, since this particular set of data ends in 2015, we don't really know where these terms are gonna go. Are they gonna go the way of CD-ROMs? Or are they going to continue growing um, and remain like, uh, you know, like online with us uh, for a longer period of time? Also notice the drop off in computer. That blue is going away. So next, I took a look at the Seattle Art Museum annual reports. Um, these are incredible annual reports, and a big shout out to librarian Tracy Timmons, who helped me contextualize and understand them. Um, 
their digitized annual reports include staff lists for every year that they have um, reports. And because of that, I was able to pull together this chart, which represents actual unique jobs. Each color bar you see here is an individual, a person, and these are their full job titles. So I took a look at the evolution of the IT department, which is not the only um, place where technical jobs are situated at SAM, but it is the first department where technical jobs were situated, and that in and of itself is interesting. So um, we see in the, this first period, um, it was called systems, and it starts off with, um, in red, uh, you, know, you have one coordinator role, and then you have a series of supporting roles, receptionist, word processing operator, data entry clerk, systems trainee, uh, funded by CETA. And uh, then there's a couple of years where we don't have data, and then we come back, and we still see that, but then we have this really big shift um, happening between 97 and 98. Uh, and in this shift, the systems department is renamed the information technology department. And some of the things that come along with this, um, a year before the change is officially made, the first leadership role is brought on board. We have our first chief of information technologies. Um, we also have the introduction of web type roles, um, new types of analysts who come on board, um, a whole slew of technical supporting roles that show up um, in the very early 2000s. And uh, really interesting to me is the fact that as systems was brought into the information technology department, um, it changed divisions. It changed divisions from uh, where it was initially located under development services to um, briefly its own division, and eventually it ended up in the finance division. Um, so you can see one singular website designer who shows up in Peach um, in the early 2000s, and after that, rapidly, all subsequent digital design roles and web roles are brought into other departments. So here's a slightly larger look at what we um, learned from SAM. These are job areas, so these color bars are no longer individual job titles. Instead, this is looking at um, the, where these roles were situated and what they were called. From the very beginning, from the very first report, there was always a designer at SAM. And I really love that for about 20 years, it was really just that, just designer. Um, no other description. Compare that to the proliferation of different types of designers we have today. There was always a photography role, but um, audio-visual roles did not really emerge until 1975 or so, but then have remained consistently present and, of course, are sort of adjacent to um, other technology roles. The yellow bar is what we were looking at earlier, the Systems Information Technology Department. Website uh, roles and jobs that have web explicitly in their title appear in 1998, right when IT um, is formed. We have a brief um, love affair with new media, um, <laughs> which uh, ends in uh, 2009. Um, and then uh, by the time that we come back from a brief gap uh, in our present day, we no longer have roles at SAM that uh, feature the word web. Instead, we have a series of roles that involve digital. Um, it's really interesting to put these two uh, visualizations charts together and uh, sort of take a look at how the terminology um, that's featured in initiatives kind of slightly precedes the creation of headcount, um, the creation of situated jobs. Um, I really like to look at the period between 2007-2017 here. Um, you can see the conjunction of that web bar with the www and website terms, and then you can see iPod, iPhone, iPad coming in and preceding digital. You can see that big lump of yellow um, down at the bottom of the chart preceding digital at SAM. These are two different institutions, um, so there's by no means anything more than a correlation here, but it still gets you thinking. So we're seeing this transition of technology going from trend to tool to job. And then we start to look um, interinstitutionally, and we start to form communities. And that brings us to MCN and MuseTech. So the last data set I looked at um, was the data which Sean was parsing earlier, um, where we looked at MCN affiliates um, going back to the 1980s. So this was the most complicated job set, or sorry, um, most complicated data set we looked at. It had the most holes, the most gaps, the most inconsistencies. But to me, in a way, it's the most valuable because here's where we get people from small museums, from large museums, and we get to see how trends are with us, um, again, across our institutions. So some of the things that you're seeing here, you know, we have words like data processing right at the beginning, um, systems further down, kind of the usual suspects, similar to what you've seen in the other things. But what's important to me here is that as we look at in what years terms appeared and disappeared, we see the 
we, we start off with so few terms, um, so few words that we use to describe ourselves, and we end up with so many. Um, we also end up with, today, in recent years, this enormous dominance of the term digital, and I think that's worth thinking about um, because it seems to be just numerically the key thing we're using to identify ourselves. So the last thing I did is um, looking at our MCN data. You know, I started off by looking at the most common terms in each year. So breaking job titles down into individual words and saying, okay, well, like in 2006, which words occurred most frequently in this little data set, just to try and grapple with and understand what we're doing. And it's kind of what you'd expect, right? But then I started looking at the most singular terms in given years. Um, so here's 1991, and this is not the most frequent. Instead, these are terms that only uh, occurred in 1991. Um, nowhere else in our data. I started looking at this and getting really interested in this thing. Okay, well, what, what appeared just in this moment? What gives us the snapshot of this moment? And that led to these um, <laughs> impressions of history. Here's the top five most singular MCN affiliate job title terms per year for a couple of years. Um, check out IS in 2006. I had to look that up to figure out that it was information systems, something that I haven't heard since then. Um, check out how in 1986, um, we were still looking at processing in 1980, but that's really gone um, by the time we get to the 2000s, 2016. Check out experience in 2016. And okay, you can probably guess what my favorite is here, right? It's Cyber Muse in 2006. I would like to bring back Cyber Muse. <laughs> Thank you. So it's from this um, amazing data set that, um, that Nicole dug up and um, Zijun helped to transcribe and Sarah worked with. Uh, I, I used that data set as the source for the at MCN 50 jobs Twitter bot. Um, so um, please follow it. The bot uses, uh, it's built on a platform called Cheap Bots Done Quick if you're interested in making your own bot um, without too much coding. And it's, um, it's using this, the, this Spectra and Conference title data as its foundation, um, except for I pulled a few more things for that like first decade from 67 to 76 because um, that data was, was sparse. So it'll create a job title for you based on um, like different constructions, manager of X, co X coordinator, like assistant head of blah, blah, blah. Um, but then the X gets filled with a, a field or description extracted from that from that um, time period. Um, so they are, it's, it's fun, it's whimsical, follow it. Uh, but I'm gonna move on to, um, a, a, just to wrap us up a little bit of a deep dive into one particular question or topic that we've been thinking about along the way. Um, in um, in two, 2014, Ed Rodley from the Peabody Essex Museum, he said uh, he noticed an increase in technology related sea level positions. Um, and um, in a blog post that he wrote on his own blog. Um, this was something that we've been thinking about and asking ourselves as well, um, is when does technology, when do technology roles reach senior museum leadership? Um, and I was really interested in this question in order to examine um, what it means about a museum's commitment to, to the, our field, right? Uh, so I particular, in the data set that I compiled for this question, um, it was one particular construction. It's the chief blank officer kind of C-suite level. Um, you guys know this construction. There are also job titles in senior level roles that aren't constructed this way. So a VP of technology, for example. Um, but, but I wanted to kind of look at something that was comparable and, and easy to search on the web. Um, and the sources included um, a lot of things pulled from the museums and the web. Um, job listings over the years, um, newspaper job postings, annual reports, museum press releases was a really great place um, to find this, and of course some LinkedIn searches um, popped up. So, um, so first we uh, look at um, the CIO and the CTO, the Chief Information Officer and the Chief Technology Officer, um, and th the earliest one roles that I found in, in all of our sources that these emerged was about 20 years ago. Um, the Guggenheim Foundation and the Cleveland Museum of Art hired their first CIO in 1996 and 1999, respectively. Um, and then MoMA um, has had a CIO since at least 2001. Um, Chief Technology Officer was kind of the second wave, a little bit overlapping with this. So uh, the Met has had a CTO since as early as 2000. The Walters Art Museum hired one in 2008. We saw that um, the Seattle Art Museum had one in 2000 and is now um, hired got rid of that role and is hiring um, another one again. 
Um, and, and these positions tend to be more about, um, about infrastructure and systems um, providing a service. This isn't always necessarily true. There are museums where, um, where these roles are more playing of a, a thinking about um, kind of visitor experience. But for the most part, um, it's, it's about these kind of internal systems and platforms. And then um, more recently, we've seen the rise of the chief digital officer um, in museums. So uh, at AMNH, they hired their first one. Um, that's the Natural History Museum in New York. Um, they hired their, their first um, chief digital officer in 2008. Um, and that person was led with the charge of, uh, of uh, or had the charge of leading a digital strategy um, formulation and implementation, seeing that word strategy in there, right, um, at the Minneapolis Institute of Art since at least 2011. Um, I have a, a screenshot of, of the kind of the high profile um, um, appointment of the Met's first chief digital officer um, in 2013. Um, I also include a few other screenshots here. The Cincinnati Museum Centers has um, announced the creation of uh, this, a CDO role to oversee the technology vision for a consortium of museums. Um, and, and the words that they use to describe this role are things like um, this, this role will be thoughtful and creative in imagining and implementing technology-based experiences that engage and immerse our visitors into a world of history, science, and childhood education. They, they use the, the line, you will make a difference. Um, and then the final screenshot I have on here that, that is impossible to read probably, uh, but it says that um, it, it's a blog post from a consultancy that does um, kind of C-level um, hiring and um, and they wrote that many cultural institutions are struggling to stay connected with evolving audiences in the digital age, uh, putting tech digital technologies at the center of strategy. For instance, by establishing a CDO is a promising start towards success. So, so these roles are focused more on on the kind of the external experience of digital technologies, um, and sometimes IT is separated from the CDO role. Sometimes it's under that. Um, whereas in the, in the CIO and Chief Technology Officer roles, you see that IT in that. Um, and to me, it signals a move from viewing technology as something that supports um, systems and digitization to a more visit visitor and audience-centered focus. Um, more recently, we're seeing the Chief Experience Officer role in museums. Um, and um, here's a... Um, uh, blog or kind of a, an article about um, how ACME hired Seb Chan as the ACME is the Australian Center for the Moving Image um, as um, as the their first chief experience officer. Um, so now we're thinking about kind of um, almost like a post digital role, right? Um, what now it's not necessarily that your purview is digital, but rather um, you're bringing a digital background, a, a museum technology background, to bring a digital <coughs> mindset, a kind of design thinking approach, a forward thinking approach, an appreciation for well architected systems. But, but like what you are putting out there doesn't necessarily have to be digital. Um, so. Um, there are other, many more roles out there that I've seen that, uh, that are these chief link officers that, um, that touch on digital, but um, uh, may not necessarily have museum digital or technology as a whole. Chief innovation officer, chief content officer, chief learning officer, the list goes on. Um, but, um, but again, it's kind of um, aligning with that shift from service to audience, service and infrastructure to audience and visitor focus. Uh, and I decided to, to compare kind of what, um, compare these roles to, um, to kind of how are, are these roles developing outside of the sector. I plugged all of these terms into Google Ngrams, which takes the corpus of Google Books um, and, and looks for frequency of different phrases or words. Um, the, the more audience-focused one roles are, seem to be, I mean, chief experience officer is something that is emerging in the field. Um, this corpus goes till 2008, so that might be why we're not seeing it in the Google Ngram um, uh, results. But the other roles, like uh, chief content officer and chief learning officer, might be something that is more, more museum-focused, right? Um, but we do see um, how chief information officer is, is the most common role, chief technology officer after that, and chief innovation officer is something that has only emerged recently. Um, to me, it, this, this is a nice quick snapshot to see how these are following larger trends and trends in the larger zeitgeist, um, and, and that, um, that museums are looking to other organizations to figure out how to structure their roles. Um, but in general, I, I was interested in this question, and what I learned from this is kind of this thinking about how 
these ideas of um, design thinking or a post-digital approach are also influencing our field as well. So, um, you know, that's, that's a snapshot of some of the things we've um, found and done in our research. Check out the blog post to learn more. Um, we still have a lot more questions that we could ask um, of this data and of more data that to be collected. Um, one possible future directions for research include expanding the scope of our research. Um, we've talked, to, we've been wondering, uh, you know, we're looking at museums, but should we be looking at cultural institutions more broadly? Um, and what will that teach us? Um, museum technology roles outside of museums, such as consultancy, consultancies and contractors. That's a really big question. We've been mostly looking at annual reports within the field. Um, it'd be interesting to see also how are these, are role, which roles are in-house um, and which roles are done by vendors at different moments in time. Um, how do smaller museums, we, we brought this up earlier that we just don't have that smaller museum data set, so how do smaller museums compare to large museums? But also how does museum type, so an art museum versus a history museum versus a science center affect or reflect the job descriptions? And then um, how do these uh, museum technology roles in younger institutions compare to those that have, for institutions that have been around longer than, than the field of, you know, than MCM has been along, around. Um, and would a kind of digital native museum design their digital infrastructure, programming, and presence differently than museums founded over a century ago? So thank you. So Na Nancy, I'm turning the mic over to you. Okay, and is this being recorded? Is it important that I speak into the mic? Okay, yeah, I will do, I will do that then. Um, so, um, first of all, I really thank you all for doing this incredible research, because in addition to being really interesting content, I think you've kind of modeled um, expert behavior and managing this kind of a research project <laughs> and all the data, and uh, I'm really, really impressed by what you've done. Um, at the beginning, Desi kind of mentioned that um, <clears throat> I have many hats, and uh, it's true. Um, I guess I'm a person who has a hard time saying no, so I left my... Uh, job in 2016 um, as head of digital experience and communications at the BMA because I had really two jobs also uh, as co-chair of MW and two kids and I wanted to s simplify my life and a year later I have three jobs and three kids <laughs> <coughs> so that didn't go so well um, and and certainly I'm not saying do as I say do because uh, you know th there's a lot that goes wrong when you're spreading yourself so thin but as we talk about trends in the future, I will say one um, advantage of my weakness for um, getting involved in things has been that I've had the opportunity to have a lot of different kinds of jobs and experiences. Starting out as an art historian, I worked as an archaeologist for a while, I kind of got into technology a little bit accidentally through curation and building online exhibitions. Through that, kind of stumbled into the mobile industry and working with an audio tour company, and you know, from there ended up inside museums. Um, and uh, that, I guess, ability to be flexible enough to move into different kinds of jobs and different kinds of institutions, I think, is is something that really is going to be increasingly required of people in our field because the field is just changing so very fast. And so maybe the, the when I, I, I do get asked a lot by museum study students and others, you know, kind of what should we be preparing for? What kind of skills do we need? And I think it's that ability to learn quickly, to learn something new quickly and not be intimidated um, by the change. That's probably gonna be one of the, the key skills that our sector will need going forward. <clears throat> but at the same time, you know, we've talked a lot about empathy in the past few years. And um, I, I am increasingly kind of aware of how we really need empathy in a sense for the kind of core mission of our cultural institutions, our memory institutions. Uh, you know, um, in reflecting on uh, museum business models, one of the things that's kind of um, become clear to me, and, and this is inspired by uh, an article that Max Anderson wrote many, many years ago in 2007, about museums as red ink businesses and kind of wondering why is that? Um, and I think it really fundamentally comes down to what we're charged with, that we have to safeguard the best of human culture and creativity and ingenuity 
um, which means that our collections are sort of by definition priceless or at least irreplaceable uh, to a large part. And we have to take care of these priceless, precious cultural artifacts forever, you know, not just for the life of the CEO or, you know, the next economic cycle, but truly forever. And um, we have to make those collections, access to them, um, available to everybody or the broadest possible audience, whether or not those audiences can afford to pay for what it costs to bring that content to them or make it accessible in some way. And I mean, that is a set of business requirements that you know, I would say would daunt the most uh, expert and successful of entrepreneurs in the business world. Um, and you don't, you don't take care of the best of human culture forever um, by, you know, being kind of frivolous or uh, uh, a whimsical or, or fickle in how you do things. Um, it requires an enormous amount of thought and care and, and carefulness. And, of course, we have people in our museums who, by personality and training, are really good at that. And um, personally, I, I've found it can often be very difficult to relate to and have empathy for and work with the people whose job is precisely to make sure that nothing changes. Because I've often played the role in the museum of the change agent or somebody who helps manage institutional change in some way. And so I think, in hindsight, that's a skill I wish I had developed more is the ability to communicate um, with people whose job, in a sense, is to resist exactly what I'm trying to do. And that should be a healthy tension. That should be a healthy dialogue about, you know, really what do we need to preserve and protect and, and continue to deliver on our mission versus what change do we need to make in order precisely to survive and to be sustainable into the future as well. All right, because the only constant is change, et cetera. Um, so, you know, flexibility and the ability to learn, I think, are core skills going forward, but also empathy and the ability to understand uh, how to work with all the different kinds of roles and personalities um, that, that are essential to the museum. Um, and so, of course, along with that goes a skill which I'm utterly lacking, which is patience. <laughs> I don't know, maybe the one thing that helps learn that is having kids, but um, uh, you know, that, um, that ability to stick with things and recognize that it may be really tough right now, there may be some icky politics in the institution, it may feel like you're being told no all the time, um, but you know, I have witnessed uh, certain institutions go from you know, just kind of like, oh my God, this is such a train wreck to really turning things around and coming out and doing some of the most interesting work in the field, you know, within the span of a decade. So having the uh, the kind of the grit to stick with it, um, I think, can also really pay off if if uh, you know if that's what you want to do. If you want to have a different job every two years, then that's fine. <laughs> you maybe can get away with having very little patience as as I have. Um, <clears throat> and I think the final the final comment that I'd say about kind of going forward, and we've already seen this trend in, in your analysis of kind of leadership titles going from CIO to CTO to chief experience officer and things that are less directly um, citing technology. You know, I think we see that in uh, conferences as well, right? MCN went from being called Museum Computer Network Conference to just MCN. And we're going through a similar sort of transition at museums in the web. In 1997, when that conference was, was launched by David Bierman and Jennifer Trant, the very fact of putting museums and the web in the same sentence was kind of radical. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now, of course, what we deal with in, these, in, in our communities and these gatherings, these conferences, goes way beyond just the web. It actually goes way beyond museums, too. You know, we're talking about social justice. We're talking about equity. We're talking about how our societies are structured. Um, I fully expect that trend to continue. Um, and so to, again, think about how, you know, technology is a tool, um, innovation even, is a tactic rather than a strategy 
Um, you know, I will make a prediction. I had a, a title once uh, when I first joined the Smithsonian American Art Museum. I was um, head of new media. And e this was 2008, and I knew, I was like, you know, this is already a quaint term, new media. Mm -hmm. um, we're now seeing, as Desi said, chief innovation officer um, uh, emerging. In fact, that's the, the title they're giving to a, a role that I sort of played at the BMA most recently. And, you know, I'm already getting self-conscious about using the word innovation. I know I've overused it, as have so many for so many years. You know, what's going to be the next term? So it, in some ways, the job titles are behind the curve huh. um, in the industry. Um, but I do think we can already see that the curve is taking us away from anything that is really focused on a specific technology or a specific tool and more on what those things do. That isn't to say that we're not going to need experts in specific pieces, you know, parts of technology or tools. You know, we still need electricians. Um, in our in our teams and in running museums, even though you know we no longer have typing pools, um, but uh, that the big the, the big kind of thrust is towards how do we integrate what we do across not just our institutions but large society uh, writ large, and uh, that's probably going to be the biggest challenge of all because. At the end of the day, and I've been saying this for many years, the technology is the easy, easy bit. It's the culture, it's the content, it's the experience that will always be the source of challenge and change, but also where the most fun will be. So I hope that's helpful. I'd love to hear what you all think. Yeah. Well, thank thank you. you so much, Nancy. That was a really fantastic response. Um, and the, the three points you brought up, flexibility, empathy and patience, especially patience, are words I've heard a lot <laughs> at this conference. Um, I don't know if anyone was in uh, what was the, the slow change session yesterday, but, um, but I feel like those are three words for MCN this year, actually. Um, well, um, I do want to open it up to conversation um, and, or to questions and, and, and start a conversation about, about this field. Um, I, but really quickly, I want to ask you a question based on what you said. Um, so, so you mentioned something kind of that you were responding to this, to the, you talked about your head of new media title, the chief innovation officer, and that sometimes titles are behind the curve. But um, we, we create job titles and, and they signal something. They're important to, to signal something to your institution, but also to outside of your institution. Um, so if, do you ever advise people or institutions on creating titles and what would, um, what do you think is important to encapsulate in a new job role like that? <laughs> I try really hard not to have to come up with titles because I'm really bad at it. Um, and I outsource that job to my husband and others wherever possible. Um, so I do talk to a lot of headhunters and, and hirers about jobs and what should be in the content. Um, I, I certainly don't have any magic uh, bullets in terms of titles. Um, I don't know, my, this is very personal, so I, I, I wouldn't take this as any kind of gospel. My experience has been that ultimately, teams are about the individuals, and it may be that in institutions of a certain scale, you can, you know, ignorant of the individuals involved, come up with an org chart and functions and define roles and then fill those roles because they're fairly specialized. Um, but in medium and smaller sized institutions in particular, it just seems to me that both the institutions are unique and the people in them are unique. And um, you have, I'm a big fan of just building jobs around the skill sets of the team and the people. And if you've got somebody great, um, you know, see first if there's a way to make that person f person's role fit within the larger whole. Um, rather than trying to get, uh, I don't know, shape, shape the role to the people rather than trying to, to force people into um, something that might work well on paper but doesn't necessarily execute well in practice. Because again, um, the change is going to be so rapid mm -hmm. and people can adapt perhaps faster than a, a, a job description, yeah. you know, once it's kind of set in stone. That's great. Well, I'd lo love to open it up to the audience um, to respond, to ask questions. Yeah, go ahead. 
Oh, for the project in particular. Well, I don't know. I yeah. Question. I yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think there are two. Uh, so the question was, where do we go next? And I think there are two directions we could go. Where do we go next in the next 50 years of our field of museum technologists, or or where do we go next immediately with our research? Do you all want to take a stab at that? I have something that came up in. Um, Desi already mentioned the slow change workshop yesterday. Uh, Thinking about that slow change workshop and what I was looking at in terms of what Rachel Ropek was introducing to us was very influenced by this. And I think that in the future, in order to be able to advocate for good practices in museum technology, it's going to become increasingly important for there to be records of what has happened. And just the idea of um, whether staff lists are available, whether people know what has happened at their institutions. If you don't know that, if you don't understand what has happened at your institution, how things have been shaped, how the placement of projects in different departments influences the agency and like the sort of mandate that those projects have, if you don't know that, it's very hard to move forward. So that's perhaps not answering like what do we do next in terms of how do we prepare ourselves as individuals mm -hmm. to go out and get the world's coolest, most wonderful jobs or most meaningful jobs, but that might be a small aspect of the work that we can all do as individuals for our institutions, for our community, for museum technology communities, um, and trying to find ways to make that information something that can be accessed and shared rather than something that simply disappears, like, oh, so many digital items can sometimes disappear. Um. I'm, I'm not sure this is what you're asking, but I, I also think um, it's an interesting thought experiment to think about what roles might emerge, even though this is, we might think about that and create wildly wrong uh, predictions off of that. Um, just thinking about some of the terms that um, we, Sarah was bringing up in the data set, things like data processing. We talk about data a lot today. We have, now museums are hiring roles that are somewhat high up who are thinking about data as a whole at our institution, not just inputting our collection data, but now rather how do we make sense of data. Um, audience insights as, some, as an area of big growth. I know, Sarah, you've, in the past, you've had really um, interesting thoughts about like even just how, to, how um, I'm gonna let you take over actually. No. I have a theory. <laughs> um, so uh, this, my theory is, Everything we always think is very based on our past experience. When I was at Guggenheim, I, was, um, I got very involved in the building. And we built an iBeacon app, and we were thinking about better understanding of the building and visitor path through the building. And that led me into design thinking, which Desi mentioned is becoming increasingly important, not just for our field, but for all businesses. So thinking about the future conjunctions of the importance of path, visitor experience, and space, um, I, I think, what did I put in that blog post? It was like, um, spatial intelligence officer. Um, you know, and, and conjunctions of what we're doing now in terms of analyzing data um, and synthesizing data, perhaps in the future, I would love to see a chief synthesis officer at institutions <laughs> whose job is not only to make sure that the data is being collected, but also that it's actually being turned into something meaningful that people can understand. So please, <laughs> hire that person. <laughs> I think one other thing that could be uh, could occur is a, a, a question of not just what jobs are created, but where they're created. Uh, are they created within the museum? Are they created in outsourcing places? And we all know that we're all financially strapped as institutions. And I know we were talking about this the other day when we were planning for the session. And since you know, bringing on new headcount is a tremendously expensive proposition. So does the model of working with an outsourced vendor, uh, does that become more important within this field as a way of you know, basically bringing on people for project work rather than uh, bringing on a full-time employee? So if you need somebody to redesign your spatial experience, you don't have to bring on headcount and then you've got somebody on full-time headcount. So I think that's another trend we could, uh, we could consider. A question over there. I think it's a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's a struggle sometimes to <laughs> invent these funky, cool sounding titles, and then they go somewhere outside the museum sector and it, it gets silly. So I think we should be cautious 
Yeah, that's a really great comment. And I think um, that's another caveat of the data set that we're working with. Um, where I think another, actually maybe another direction we could go in is doing more qualitative research and talking to people who had these roles in a, in a more robust way. But um, that a title doesn't necessarily, um, while a title can, we can get some information and in a job description, we can get some information of um, what a museum values and and what where their directions are and we looking at an org chart can be helpful it's not always the reality and Nancy yeah, yeah. Well, I was just going to say to, to Richard's kind of question as well um, maybe the next step for this particular analysis is to bring this data set of about titles together with where those positions are in the org chart I mean it makes an enormous difference whether digital technology whatever you want to call it that that function is under the CFO versus the director um, you know, is it seen as a cost, an overhead that needs to be managed, or is it seen as a strategic investment? Um, so that would be an area to look. And also, you know, just think making wild predictions. I think we should look, to, to your point, uh, to the things that are going to be happening on the margins and outside of the museum. So you're quite right. I'm, I'm so excited that there are finally digi uh, data analyst being, positions being created. I think Tate was the first one. Now Met has one, right? But it's the big museums who can afford to have a person who is a data expert and is analyzing data all day. Small to medium-sized museums need that, too. So are there opportunities for... Uh, partners, commercial partners, to offer that almost as software as a service, but with the human element. Um, you know, one of the things that we found with the, the MuseWeb Foundation initiative, so we're providing uh, kind of storytelling um, solutions for organizations large and small, and um, have found that what's needed of us is not just the platform and the technology consultancy, but also human resources, actual digital curation is in some ways more critical than the technology piece that we're providing. And you know, we're, we're serving actually small teams in big museums, but also small organizations who can't afford to hire a digital curation, curator full time, but they need a part of one. They need you know, five hours a week or 10 hours a week. And so I think there's gonna be more of that kind of on the margins outsourcing of functions. But also, and this is where I'm really excited, um, is to see museums and we're seeing this in the storytelling initiative, starting to work with their communities in a way. Um, so I can take the analogy of, of how um, PR teams, communications teams in museums work with, with journalists. So there's an exhibition or, or some event or, or part of the collection that's being featured. The museum team will put together a package of digital assets, uh, some curatorial essays, some background information, give it to the journalist. The journalists write their own stories, their own content about that, and take it to their audience through their distribution platforms. What if we take that model and we start going to people other than you know journalists or the usual suspects, but we're going to the storytellers in the target communities that we're trying to reach, these, these new audiences that we have such a hard time attracting to our, our you know, frankly, mainly college-educated, middle-class, white institutions. Um, and we're, we're inviting those storytellers, those communicators, to use the museum as a digital asset repository, to get raw materials, to talk about what's interesting to them and their communities, 
to those communities in the voice, the language, the tone, the style, the media that those communities are already using. That's, to me, one of the most interesting phenomena, because that's where the outside communities will start transforming the museum and truly shaping it into what they need it to be, rather than what we think in our little <laughs> bubbles those communities need and are you know, usually going to get wrong. It's 11 o'clock, but if no one's kicking us out, I'll take that one last question really quick. Okay. We're going to figure that out. Um, <laughs> there's currently, if, if you want immediate access, I've stuck the visualizations up on my personal website. I think there might be um, future MCN. We, we've been using MCN blog platform. So a lot of our stuff is up on the blogs we've been posting for the last uh, two months or so, and that may be another asset. Um, but just like keep your eyes peeled wherever it gets posted. You'll be able to find it through MCN channels. Uh, how do you contribute? Yeah, that's a great question, and not one that we've necessarily thought about. I, so for my data set for the Chief Blank Officer, I've created a spreadsheet that's a Google Doc that people can add or write suggestions on it. Um, uh, so you can get to that from the blog post. Um, and um, we, uh, we were tasked with working through until this, like for the MCN 50 celebration, but I'd love to keep the conversation and keep working on the project. Yeah. Museum stat as in statistics? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, let me, uh, let me just, uh, that would be very cool. We've got more work to do. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, to that end, uh, we're going to do an ad hoc MCM legacy sit today at 12.30 in the city meeting in the urban room. It doesn't actually exist, but Marla thinks we should create one, so we're going to create one. <laughs> <laughs> because what, what can we learn from the past to help drive us forward? So if you're interested in these questions, join us in the urban room at 12.30. Is this an unsig? It's an unsig. An unsig. <laughs> an unsig. <laughs> an unsig. Wait, what time is that, 12.30? I love that. <laughs> love it. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone.